Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Our guest today is Brett Koretsky. Uh, Brett, appreciate you being here again, man. I really appreciate you coming on. And yeah, just want to tell us, first of all, where you're calling in from. Um, I already personally, I know you're in New York already, but um, yeah, tell us where you're calling in from and uh, what you do for a living with Unicorn. And uh, I know you have some other you know, ventures that you're obviously a part of as well. But uh, let's just kind of start there with uh, with Unicorn. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, hey, guys, it's, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's nice to join you in the discussion about CPG, um, the overall industry, and kind of where my background kind of lenses itself and then where I think uh, the industry is going and, and where I think our company is going. So I'm, I'm based in, in New York predominantly. Uh, right now, I'm actually calling in from a lake house out in Virginia. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, which I love. Uh, it's really, really nice down here. It's just kind of step away from the hustle and bustle of New York. Virginia is a great place. It's about 25 minutes outside of Charlottesville. So you still have access to re- you know real life. It's not just like you know living in the woods. Um, but yeah, that's where are you calling from? Oh, so I'm, I'm back in uh, upstate New York today. Uh, I kind of split my time between uh, Poughkeepsie upstate and uh, Midtown East of Manhattan, uh, where my girlfriend really? lives. So yeah, I'm, de- I'm definitely a New York native as well. Uh, kind of just take the metro north up and down. Usually every like three to four days, you no know, depending. So Hudson Valley and yeah, in Manhattan for sure. Cool. Yeah, man. So I know uh, we chatted a little bit last time about obviously uh, your, your company, Unicorn. So can you took me kind of through, you know, your process and experience and tell us a little bit more about that brand and uh, yeah. kind of how you got your start with that one to start. Yeah. Yeah. So Unicorn's been like, uh, at this point, it feels like a lifelong kind of journey. Uh, started out kind of in a much different format than it is today. Um, it even ended in a different format than it is today. Um which is kind of funny, and it really even even hasn't hasn't even really kind of gotten going. But it's going to be going under a different structure uh, than I ever in my life anticipated. So yeah, back uh, I got my feet wet in CPG and retail and business ownership when I was in my mid twenties. I had started my own company called Montauk Juice Factory, originally delivering juice on my bike, which kind of took off very kind of local way uh was received really really well uh struck a chord with neighbors and friends and family and then yeah i didn't know what to call what i was doing but i was just getting healthy uh so i uh it just kind of came very natural to me so we would just we began like recipes experimenting i started like getting my family and brother involved and we would juice all night like you know, put it in mason jars and we eventually got plastic bottles. And it just, it took a year or two to kind of progress into a brand, which we eventually called Montauk Juice Factory. Um, And then at that point, I had gotten um, one of my uh, very, very close friends, Madeline and Murphy involved, who was kind of a little bit more experienced with recipes. And and, um, at that point in my life, marketing and branding, which I was coming from finance and insurance. So she was a big help in in teaching me how uh, to market and and brand something. Um, I ended up getting a designer involved, creating a logo, and then we got a store and we got big equipment and we hired people and we had everything going um, and it took off. I mean, it just, it was like, it it moved fast. You know, for a small little kitchen, uh, tiny, I mean, a tiny kitchen to, you know, hundreds of people in line at our store to get the drinks um, during the summer. So Montauk Juice Factory became uh, a big hit out in the Hamptons every summer. Keep it really simple. We then uh, opened up a cafe in Brooklyn. Uh, and that cafe was... Uh, like a groundbreaking concept at the time. Uh, this is 2016, right? 2015, 2016. Now you see it everywhere, but we, we were calling it at that point a plant alchemy bar. And the plant alchemy bar is essentially exactly what it, it its name is. Um, but we called it The End, which was kind of like within the Montauk Juice Factory kind of brand 
extension ethos thing, right? Um, and our main product originally when we first opened was coffee. Uh, we did not really uh, know what we were going to do it when we had first opened. So we kind of just rolled the dice and we're like, you know what, we're passionate about what we're doing. We're just going to figure this thing out. And um, that's what we did. You know, we got we, we put up a menu. We started selling coffee drinks. Um, we stole our juices from Monto Juice Factory. We sold a lot of like raw foods. Um, and then we were like, no, we need to just like change what we're doing. We need something that's really going to like, we figured out quick how hard it is to open up a, a small mom and pop store in Brooklyn um, and a cafe. And we're like, oh, this is nothing we're doing is getting people in the door, right? So we are like, okay, we need to come up with like a menu of like really, really forward thinking, colorful drinks that nobody else is selling in Brooklyn. Um, so we took that kind of concept of like the juice and like coffee and we like turn that around into a menu that was just like super like creative and fascinating so we're like we want to make fun colorful food and make wellness like cool and exciting and taste great and not be like boring or pretentious we wanted it to be like above reproach so people would come and feel welcomed and and open up a safe space for like anyone and everyone um so we started uh Coming up with names for drinks and recipes, and we felt like we we're like, oh, we're back at this again. Like we felt like we were in the basement creating the juice factory again, right? But like I love that environment. Like I love that be even before your company is a company, right? Like that entire experiment is just so fun. So the drink, one of the our main drink that we came out with was called the Unicorn Latte, and that drink uh, went viral on social media. Uh, not just like viral, like like insane. Like it was like the it was like the coronavirus of like lattes on social media. <laughs> so I was like, you know, Japan, and China, like our data was nuts. Australia, like everywhere in the world, just like wanted this drink. Um, and back then, when something went viral, it actually freaking meant something, right? It was like, oh, like it really stuck short. back then. It wasn't just like a one and done viral for a yeah, day. Like it, it so stuck around. Yeah, everything sure. goes viral now. It's yeah, like TikTok right. chain. TikTok didn't even exist. Yeah, right. Right. So yeah, and it not only went viral on social, but it was a PR machine. So it was like it became on every. It wasn't just like oh, here's this viral video. It was like it was a legitimate product attached to a legitimate business, and it went through every PR outlet and media outlet that you could ever imagine. Vogue, Covator, you know, Variety, Daily News. I mean, we we're on the cover of like. Uh, the post, all the crazy stuff, you know, like every single thing you can imagine. Like, wow, this is nuts. Um, and then once, about three months in, Starbucks had created a unicorn frappuccino after the unicorn latte. And that's when we had a disagreement with them and we came to a cordial understanding. And then years later, it happened again uh, with another company called Speedway. Uh, which is a big gas station chain. Um, so we had another disagreement with them as well. They liked it so much that they decided to use it. But yeah, so 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 we came out the other side of all this, right? And the coronavirus, the coronavirus became like a huge thing. Uh, we shut our businesses down after operating for about seven years, and I didn't really know what to do. You know, uh, we had like some, you know, employee issues, we had payroll issues, we had all kinds of crazy things kind of come to like a, a head uh, after like just having a great, in my opinion, and a great experiment, right? We had never imagined to live in retail for our entire uh, business venture. Uh, we never, we, we didn't. We, the retail footprint was meant to build a customer base build an authentic and genuine following around our brands, market our brands, advertise local, just like how, what you're supposed to do, which I think a lot of businesses just don't do correctly. Um, and that's why they all fail. Uh, CBG is really, really hard in them. So you manufacture a co-packer, nobody ever meets you, sees you. You become just like an absent brand with no soul no essence nothing and it just never seems to work right no matter what you 
distributor after distributor after distributor and your stuff doesn't turn, you're out and you're like going back into innovation again because you're like, oh, this didn't work. You need another product. And, you know, three years later, $2 million down and you're just like, well, nothing yeah, it doesn't work. So that's why CPG is so hard because these brands have no soul. And in order to turn and to land big boys, Targets, Walmart, Costco's, those are the, those are the places that are going to change your work change your life. Those are the places that are going to bring in business. These small DSDs and things like that in and out of the city and like, you know, it's just, there's no money in that, right? That's just support brand support. That's just marketing, right? The big money is in the big retailers, you know, whether it's big box, grocery, it's also in convenience, right? So 11s, Speedways, Circle Ks, Wawa's, right? The, the channels that you're focused on are mass, big box, and convenience, right? And those channels require immense amount of brand equity, loyal customer loyalty, and then and then if you don't have that, you're never going to get them, ever. They will not get you in the door. So and then brokers, so you know the drip business is very much sales driven by broker relationships. So you need to have really really good broker relationships. If you don't have broker relationships, your brand doesn't get anywhere either. So. And even if you do, and you're, if you have to have a great brand and you have to have a, a great product and you have to have really good relationships. Uh, I think so. Yeah. So, so, so when we had shut down and just to kind of backtrack, when we had shut down our stores, um, I was kind of soul searching like anyone would, right? I'd say like, I didn't really panic. I'm kind of like a guy that's just like, I don't know what's happening is supposed to be happening. I mean, I've made all these choices. I created them. So um, in some place, you over, overthink a lot when you're in situations like that, where you're kind of like, shit, what the hell do I do, man? You know, like, why did I make that, that choice? Why didn't I just, just stick to my nine to five, making you know, 150, 200K a year and just, you know, just live my life? Um, I don't know why. I still don't know why I didn't. I, I mean, I th I had like a I have a super addictive personality in, in some ways. Like I I like I am a total entrepreneur. Like if I could, I'd live off ramen noodles until like I made this thing work. And it has zero zero to do with money. So <laughs> if it had to do with money, I'd go back to my nine to five. Trust me. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, I find a lot of the things that you've said, I find as like very common denominators between some of the most successful people I've had on the podcast in the CPG space, which is like, if you're doing it for the money, probably not going to work out like that. That is, that's not how you build a CPG brand. And like, whenever I ask, you know, that question of like, you know, if you go back and start the business again, if you like, what advice would you give yourself uh, or to give somebody else if they were getting started in CPG? It's like a lot of what you already said as an answer to that question time and time again, which is like, you have to start local, like you have to get a real actual following and have a real personality to your brand like people can tell if this is just something you just made and like you'll plug ten thousand dollars a month and paid ads and there's nothing really going on it's just like oh. it's just like a transaction machine um so I, th I think it's all really important especially for somebody who obviously has had you know some su success in cpg like you have um you know when you hear those things time and time again it's not really anecdotal evidence anymore it's like it's like really like what it takes to be like be in in that space so um your insights are obviously super valuable i appreciate that and i guess what what kind of uh transitions did you make obviously like post covid did you I know you said you were looking to get working with retailers, but obviously that was kind of a difficult time to get into retailer relationships too, because a lot of that stuff was closed. Not, not a lot of foot traffic was going through there, right? So, did you adopt any kind of um, you know D 2 C online selling during that time as well yeah. as you were looking to you know so get I'll into tell you more exactly retail? What I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so let's backtrack a little bit, right? So we closed the stores, um, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna just keep going with this thing. And um, it's free. my everyone I met with, like, dude, you're out of your mind. Like, you're just going to keep going on the same. I'm like, yeah, we're going to do a little different stuff. So, so I created a C Corp uh, called uh, Unicorn Drinks. And um, that was like a spinoff from the two businesses, the one in Brooklyn and the one in Montauk Cruise Factory. So two brands, two businesses, now a third business, third brand. All related, though, right? It's like an evolution. Right. I think one mistake I made was that they should have just all been one business <laughs> instead of three businesses. But I think, right, they were like all structured differently. There were different people involved and it complicated a lot of things. But I think from just like a simplicity standpoint, one business would be the way to go. And, and the, the brand thing is not important from a standpoint of like, you know, white paper, 
All right. right. It's right. just those that's just the front end of your stuff, you know, what you're what you're marketing, what your socials are. So so we create a new line, a product called so I want originally I really wanted to create the unicorn latte. And I said, you know what? Like I'm not gonna create the unicorn latte because I'm uncertain about what our future is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a drink that may not be our primary goal of go to market, and I'm going to attract attention. So that's exactly what I did. So I created a drink called the Unicorn Lemonade. It's called the Unicorn Superfruit Fizzy Lemonade. Uh, it was like rainbow cans, like unbelievably tasty stuff, like just a great product. But it, it was it was a fizzy lemonade. It was sparkling lemonade, and it came in like three different flavors. Use like super fruits and some like really, 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 really well sourced organic ingredients, all local. And uh, we have like a really, really cool agency that I actually still work with today. And my and all my stuff do the do the design and branding, and create the website, social, the whole thing. And then I started gift. I created about I did a small production run. Our first run was about fifteen, twenty thousand cans. Um, a friend at a manufacturer kind of went out on a limb for me and he's like i'll do it man fine you know he's a good man his name's mache he's in brooklyn yeah things weren't always easy between us two but i think like he's just like i'm here to support what you're doing and it's like let's get the cans going so so we did it and then i started gifting like instead of gifting influencers right which a lot of people do i started gifting business people which is very different. I wasn't like, okay, I'm gonna, I need to create so much hype around this. I'm like, I need to create a network of like business people as opposed to a network of influencers and market, which I had always done in the past and customers. I need like a network of like people who are like intelligent on in business in CPG. So I started like, focusing on LinkedIn and then gifting these products to like people in the CPG industry. And so that is how um, I ran into Anovio. So that was years ago, almost going to be three years. So I had met a gentleman named Ahmed. Um, he was the CMO of Pepsi for a long time. Uh, and then it just kind of Went from there, we started talking about the business, what I like to do, uh, how I view the business, blah, 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 kind of all the boring shit. And then, yeah, we, we spoke for maybe a year, I think every month. Um, and then finally, he's uh, like, it just worked out. I joined the team and uh, we uh, I brought Unicorn along. Uh, so it was like, kind of like a package deal kind of thing. And, uh, and, and then the rest is history. So now I work for, for Ilvium. Uh, partner in the business um, and we're working on kind of growing our brands um, hoping that we launch unicorn potentially sometime next year um, every year we're both both of us are like yeah we're going to do it this year we're going to do this and then we just like just doesn't happen because we're just so busy but i think um, the intention is there i think we both have kind of a long-term view the business isn't built for us to exit um structurally it's built for her for us to 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 win long term it's it's not like oh we're gonna, it's going to be like a huge this is going to be a huge you know, five year race to 50 million or 90 million or 100, whatever. And then we're just going to exit. It's not built that way. So, so I think for us, it, 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 Anovium is like a global food and beverage platform that takes new brands to scale, right? So, so it supports the a founders or co founders' initial concept, right? So, so we don't. Right. So, so we don't just like take any brand. Like, we're not like, okay, let's, you're in a hundred doors. Let's, we're not an agency. Right, Does that make right. sense? We're, right. We're a business. So, so, so we're an actual startup business too. So, so, right. We're, we're not like an agency that's like, oh, we'll scale your ads or whatever. It's like, we're an actual business. Like, we perform like actual operations. <laughs> so, we co pack we have co packers, we have international warehousing systems, we have um distribution networks, relationships um all around the world, um in the UK, in Dubai, UAE, Mexico, uh US. So so 
the way what we've done to date is we've essentially created three brands, core brands of our portfolio. BFY, we have uh, you know a, a cool shot, you know, healthy food shot. Uh, drink shot with honey and reservatol. It's like an immunity shot under the Nature Geeks brand. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a chocolate dipped vegan protein bar. Comes in like three, like fudge brownie, caramel crisp, like just really kind of like fun flavor combinations and a Sounds cookie awesome, dough. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're just bomb flavors and all healthy, right? And then under the Nature Geeks brand, we also have a like an elderberry and mango immunity, like hydration mix comes in little sachet powders. Uh, also just like delicious, like heavy in potassium, right? So it's all about like hydrating with potassium um, and not sugar, right? So it's like, okay, like instead of like your banana, like, you know, here's, you know, a little sachet, it's, you know, it comes in different flavors. It's fun. Like, Instead of having just like a banana and water, have, you know, this is just, an, it's an option, right? It's also like, you know, it's not RPD, so it's it ships well, direct to consumer, right to people's doorsteps. It, it's great on Amazon, right? Even though that, that category is just like a fucking war, you know, with the IQ, IQ mix and I, liquid IV and propel. Everyone has like a mix now powder um but you know like anything you find your you find your people right and they subscribe and they keep coming back I mean, it's a slow slow build and then we have a brand called tranquini which is my favorite brand in the portfolio especially now actually when i came in it was my favorite brand uh, i love the name i think the name is super cute and cool um i think people in some people don't get it because they don't they just they don't get marketing. <laughs> so it's like, you can never forget that name. It's just like, the best part is, is like I'd say about 25% of the people pronounce it wrong. And that is the key. <laughs> so it's like, okay, so you were, it just creates conversation, right? So it's like, it's just an interesting brand. Uh, it just has a long history. It started in 2014 or 2013. And it was in Austria where Red Bull was started. It became like a huge hit in like 60 countries all over the world, that not in the UK, not in the US, not in Mexico, not in Canada, like North America, no North America, right? So this was like Middle East, right? Abu Dhabi, Dubai, UAE, like Uzbekistan, like all these like crazy, like cool, like countries, developing countries that like, that's what people drink like around the world they drink like real drinks like with herbs and like like healthy that's what people are looking for that's like it's like a eastern medicine kind of adaptogens uh so there's six essential adaptogens in the drink lavender blossom uh passion flower ashwagandha chamomile lemon balm l-theanine like this thing is just like packed with like just really really good stuff comes in like Three cool flavors, hibiscus, ginger, lemongrass, um, and mixed berry. So, so when I came in, I'm like, oh, this drink is like totally my vibe. I love this thing. <laughs> like, you know, so I started drinking it. I really got attached to it. I'm like, oh, I feel like it's like my own brand now, you know? <clears throat> and that's how I do well with marketing. It's like when I really feel like it's like something that I um, I can get behind, like that I'm passionate about. So we rebranded it. So I brought in a friend from overseas um, in the UK uh, who was just like, she is just so great, like the most creative person. I, one of them, probably not the most, but top three most creative people that I know. And I'm like, dude, you got to go to work on this thing. <laughs> Pretty tough. So she's came out with a bunch of options. Our CEO awesome. and then pick pick the one we like the best. Yeah, that's um, awesome. And I guess when you think about you know something like this, obviously you look for brands that you want to work with through Inovium now. Things that you could see yourself getting behind, things that you know is kind of in your lane, and things that you can get like you know kind of fired up, and passionate about because it's yeah, something you yeah, did from always. the ground up in your own business, right? So, uh, what other kind of things do you look for as far as you know prospective uh, brands that you're looking to like help bring to market with your connections with their on the on the operative side of things? What other kind of characteristics do you look for in a brand or even like a or even like a founder that you meet, uh, yeah. what do you kind of look for in that regard? Totally. That's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking for a founder, right? I, I mean, it's not my money, right? So right. I don't, I'm not out there with my wallet open. So 
I think it's like I'm looking for founders that are just like, I wouldn't say they're like me, but they're like, A, they don't have an ego or like need to control everything. Right, right. So that's the first thing. Uh, because if you think that that's going to happen, it's not. Because you know, uh, that's just not. That's not how I am at all. So like, I'm ready. I can all hand the keys to somebody if they think it's great and they can do a great job and make those choices. And that's what I did. So you'd have to be willing to do the same. Second thing I'd say is a product that actually right solves a, a problem in grocery or convenience or retail or whatever like is actually solving a problem like not just that you think it is it's just like that actually is and that is white space so like when you look at this game is categorical right so and then that categorical framework is fragmented or segmented and you're like your product needs to like fit in there somewhere it's got to be perfect has to be absolutely perfect. It and, does. It has to fit into like one of those categories, but also stand out so much that it's almost creating its own category at the same time. But familiar enough where people can say, okay, I've approached this like idea for something. And like, th like if I were to make it, this is what I would make. I feel like that's what really can draw people in. And so it's, it's, it's a good perspective to think about that because it is very categorical. Even though you're trying to carve your own lane, a lot of people think of themselves as category creators with products that they make. <laughs> it's very rare that it's actually the nah, case. Um, and even yeah. if it is, like you need to still find resonance in a category that people are already familiar with and open-minded to trying. So I think it's, it's actually, it's a really, yeah, it's a really perfect way to explain that. I think, I think is, is so true yeah yeah i think it gets lost direct to consumer right yeah, so yeah. here's the issue especially dc yeah you're an rtd drink right and you're like oh, i'm gonna go after direct to consumer it's like you're an amateur dude right like you there's maybe there's one brand right now that's experimenting with it every other brand that i know that's gone direct to consumer ready to drink they never get anywhere in retail ever because you don't even understand the category you're cannibalizing yourself right so your vertical is there is no categorical framework and you're building infrastructure that is totally unrelated to the business model that works for ready to drink beverages so your entire company becomes a silo for a business model that is not even proven so um, right now there's one brand i will not name the name um, but I do know the founder and I do like him very, very, and I actually do love the brand and I do love the drink. So I yeah, RT, RTD can be especially difficult because <laughs> it's extremely heavy as well. So trying to figure out logistics on like a, not a super big scale, like as like a growing, like, like a, uh, you're ready to drink direct to consumer brand. Liquids are just so, so heavy. I mean, it just, oh, it, all your cost for shipping is just like goes through the roof. So that's it's definitely something I hear from like a lot of folks that do come on. But I will say, I have I have definitely spoken to some people on podcasts who have had like they get big, big success selling DTC ready to drink stuff and like do have some success using it as like a proof of concept to go then and talk to retailers. But it's hard because it's not like most things that like if you can figure it out DTC, the margins are that much better. That's not necessarily the case with ready to drink things all the time because the shipping is so expensive because it's so heavy. So shipping in bulk to either distributors or retailers or working with brokers and things like that can really help cut that cost down. I mean, if you're selling like, you know, apparel or even like a lot of food doesn't work way as much as like you know a single serving of a drink weighs oh. probably three times as much as a single serving of food <laughs> most of the time, you know so shipping yeah. a six pack but so you sh you're shipping a six pack it's like 12 bucks to ship it exactly exactly yeah so it's like, it, it's, it's, it's minimum so yeah. every six like yep. you said yep. there is no business model in the world that it could ever work um doing that so there's a drink right now that's experimenting with this whole direct to consumer stuff but i've known a lot if you remember there was a brand years and years and years ago called dirty lemonade um sounds familiar. Dirt, I'm sorry dirty lemon and dirty uh lemon. it was yeah, before it lemon familiar. before lemon perfect so dirty lemon was run by this guy zach they were like pioneers dude this is like the sickest brand of every celebrity drinking this shit hollywood beverly hills to miami south beach to this club in new york like this thing was hot right in every pr magazine you could think vogue vanity covator i don't care what pr it didn't matter it was everywhere the big they're like 10 or 11 dollars a bottle right this is like during the cold press juice thing gone 
nobody even seen it, never even made retail, you know? They're doing millions and millions and millions of dollars online every month. Doesn't matter because they're just losing cash, they're burning cash doing that. I mean, just, so there's that. And then, and then there are so many others. And I don't want to just go through the, through the list. Yeah, no, but it's, it's, it's a good point, though. It's a good thing to be wary of if you're looking you to do massive you know, volume, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, so it's just like, your drinks are like selling for a dollar or two, right? That's your market. Like mm-hmm. that's the market is. Like, it's a fight to the bottom. It's commoditized products. You're selling aluminum cans with liquid in it. Like right. it's a funny design on the front. I mean, that's what's really going on, right? That's what the market thinks it is. So yeah, you know, I think that they're they're just like, you know, back to like what we were saying, like, you know, there's so many categories right now. I'd say there's in my head, I could just name five categories that I would innovate in that are just like dormant and boring. And like, you're one of them, right? You're one of them. Was, I was name one, right? So I would look at like ambient, right? Super convenient, <laughs> grab and go. So the best innovation for that can support velocities, high velocities is the microwave. As crazy as that sounds, it's in every kitchen, it's underused, and it's it's like the people in this country are just always like faster and cheaper. That's what works best. So if you can make that healthy, um, listen, I don't know nothing you put in the microwave is healthy, but uh, <laughs> I mean, it's what it is, right? I mean, I'm not here to like change the microwave industry, but I think like, you know, if you can come up with like healthy food or snack that can go in the microwave and you can make it a minute or less and it's ambient and it's simple, but it's complex innovation, right? So it's, it looks really simple. And the only reason why it's that simple is because the, the back end of that innovation trail is really, really kind of complex, so I think that that that's somewhere that I would I would kind of put my attention. If I, could. I think yeah, like, no, I, I I like that. I mean, it, it it is true. I mean, the the whole microwave kind of boom. I suppose like when it first came out, you know, <laughs> like the the nuclear family whole thing, no, and the microwave man. came out, and it was like the best thing ever. But then it it got this big objection somewhere along the way that. I don't know if people are willing to overcome still, which is just there's just all these problems with like, you know, microwave technology wasn't safe. Uh, certain yeah. things you can't put in or it's like dehydrating the food. Hey, like it's just like sucking the nutrients out of the food. Yeah. So I think there, there is definitely white space for innovation there. I don't know what that is. I think it would be a difficult objection to overcome, though, like the, the, the consumer education you would have to do to under to get people to understand that, like, no, this is different. All these things is like that you used to hear about why microwaves are bad. Like, it's not necessarily true. And like we did it this way to overcome those things. So, um, so, but I think so you're like, right in general. But I think it's the, I, I, those are just be like, I feel like some of the immediate hurdles. It's just like, uh, like even oh, for me, well, I'm, I'm like, I don't want to microwave my so shit. I'd rather hurdles. heat it up in a pan again, like because <laughs> that, it's, I, I just hate the way it comes out of the microwave. But uh, no, you're definitely right, though. I could definitely see that for sure. I don't like the way anything comes out of the microwave either, right? But I'm talking about a market, right? So it's like, right, right. You'll have your naysayers and you'll have hurdles, of course, but like the 90% of our country is microwaving shit. So, right, it's like, listen, it's not like, oh, this is for like Paris Hilton's crowd. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. You know, Bill Gates isn't eating microwave food, but I think like, uh, yeah, the vast majority of our population is microwave foods. Um, and, if you can make it a little bit healthier, fine, cool, great. I think like, uh, yeah, I mean, the ready to drink is the, the biggest, I think, opportunity in, in ready to drink is non-alcoholic drinks. Uh, it's just a huge, huge uh, believer in its uh, expansion, um, not only because of the dealkalization of our population, um, but the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the uh, supply problem of those drinks. So I think the, there is a is a large demand and a limited supply of non-alcoholic drinks, and, and that's what you're seeing. So um, that's what I'm seeing. Um, last year, I think buyers were just whatever. I think coming out of COVID still, I think a lot of them were hopping around the last few years and trying to find their footprint. Um, and this like looming massive market opportunity for just non-alcoholic drinks, not like mushroom lion's mane ashwagandha right, right. it's like that is not the market 
the market is a non-alcoholic drink that's above reproach and palatable and fun, colorful, tastes great, and like makes people feel brand that makes people feel good and and is like authentic and genuine, like just brand that like just is above reproach. Like you don't want to be super boring and dry, right? Like, and you're not set. Like you may have some really, really listen. If you're talking DR direct response DRC campaigns, like cool, like hit those at those intrinsic attributes and like drive your edge. Great. Cool. That's not going to get you where anywhere in depth. Nowhere. It's a, a brand new in five or $8 million a month. Is the same thing as a brand new in a hundred K in beverage. Same thing. You're still like this spec on the radar. You don't really get to just grind out. You don't, if you're not grinding out volume or you're not vertically integrated, you're not even a, you're like a, toddler <laughs> so it's like yeah so uh, i don't know i mean we're all you know listen we're all just trying to get to where we're getting to and doing our best and with the experiences that we have and um yeah man no well, i appreciate it. you uh yeah brad I just want to say thank you again bro for coming on and um <laughs> i appreciate the conversation i love how deep yeah. you think about you know the work that you're doing and obviously the, C the cpg space i mean there's a there's an infinite amount of interesting conversations to be had because there's always room for new innovation. So I really appreciate you being part of this conversation. And uh, I just want to give you an opportunity as well, Brad, for anybody listening who maybe, you know, does have a you know radio drink CPG brand or maybe just wants to get in touch with you. Like what's the best way to stay in touch if they want to learn maybe more about Anovium, but also, uh, you know, your experience with Unicorn or anything else? Yeah, Matt, thank you so much for having me on. Honestly, it's really, really been a great time to kind of like share my thoughts i haven't it's been yeah, a man. long time i had a lot of stuff going on in my mind that i haven't really talked to anyone about so it's been cool to talk to you yes sir um, and like our last conversation was great learning a little bit more about you before even coming on and, um if anybody wants to chat um whatever it is care uh ready to drink you know food beverages just life uh brett.kretzky at novium.com find me on instagram too at uh the kid brett or uh, find me on LinkedIn, uh, my last Brett Koretsky, which you can kind of see right there. Awesome, man. Well, Brett, I just want to say thank you again for coming on, man. I just want to wish you the best of luck, continue success in everything you're doing. And yeah, we're looking forward to staying in touch. Obviously, when you're back in New York, definitely hit me up too. We'll, yeah, uh, we'll definitely have to get together next time man. in the city. Absolutely, dude. All right, Brett. I appreciate you, Thanks, man. Matt. Talk soon. Talk soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.